open this public hearing of the Joint Standing Committee uh, on the National Broadband Network. We're joined um, today by Ms Templeman, Dr Allen, Senator Antic, Mr Connolly, Senator Davey, Senator Farrell, um, Mr Simmons. Um, I think Mr Mitchell is scheduled to, scheduled to join us as well. I'm still getting really bad feedback, so can people put their phones on mute, please? This is a public hearing and a, and a Hansard transcript of the proceedings is being made. The hearing is also being broadcast via the Australian Parliament House website. I remind witnesses that in giving evidence to the committee, they are protected by parliamentary privilege. It's unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of evidence given to a committee and such action may be treated by the Senate as a contempt. There's also contempt to give false or misleading evidence uh, to the committee. The committee generally prefers evidence to be given in public, but that the, under the Senate resolution, witnesses have the right to request to be heard in private session. If a witness objects uh, to a to answering a question, the witness should state the ground upon which the objection is taken and the committee will determine whether it will insist on an answer. Having regard to the, that ground which is claimed, if the committee determines to insist on an answer, a witness may be requested um, may, may request that the answer be given in camera. Such a request may, of course, also be made at any other time. A witness called to give uh, a question, uh, to an answer to a question for the first time should state their full name and the capacity in which they appear and witnesses should speak clearly to assist Hansard um, in the recording of proceedings. I ask that all committee members and witnesses mute their microphones uh, unless given the call to speak to ensure that all questions and responses can be heard. If members experience connection problems during the hearing, please contact the Secretariat during, directly or, or through the WhatsApp uh, group. If during the hearing witnesses are disconnected from the video conference and unable to rejoin, please contact the Secretariat to be connected via teleconference. To assist Hansard, I remind all speakers to state their name prior to speaking. Uh, those, uh, thankfully, colleagues uh, and witnesses are the formalities over. I welcome representatives of the Australian communications consumer network. Thank you for taking the time to give uh, evidence today. I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses and evidence has been provided to you for the Hansard record. Could you please state your full name and the capacity in which you appear today? I'm Teresa Corbin. I'm the CEO of the Australian Communications Consumer Action Network. I'm Luna Lawrence and I'm the Director of Policy at the Australian Communications Consumer Action Network. Um, excellent. Thank you, uh, Ms Lawrence and Ms Corbin. Um, I now invite you to make a short opening statement and at the conclusion of your remarks, I'll invite members of the committee um, to uh, ask questions. Colleagues, colleagues again, again, there's one, there's one of us on the line who hasn't muted our device and it will, I think, uh, bear, wear very thin. Um, Ms. Um, Ms. Lawrence and uh, Ms. Corbin, if, if you can proceed with your opening statement. Okay, thank you. So we do want to thank the committee for the opportunity to, to present today. ACAN is the national peak organisation for communications, consumers and small business. And we represent over 100 organisational members across Australia that en encompass different sectors of the community, including rural and remote Australians, low income consumers, people with disability, older people and youth, culturally and linguistically diverse communities and indigenous organisations and remote communities. Communications are an essential service for consumers and play an increasingly an important role in, the, in accessing uh, both government and private sector online services. Access to communication services ensures that individuals can remain socially connected, engage with health and emergency services, as well as educational and employment opportunities. MBN is a critical infrastructure project that is having a transformative effect on the way that Australians connect with one another, their communities and the opportunities offered by the digital economy. The ongoing COVID-19 restrictions and lockdowns have highlighted the importance of ubiquitous and reliable internet connectivity to facilitate remote working, online education and delivery of telehealth services. However, despite a decade of record investment in telecommunications infrastructure, 
the affordability of end -end services is becoming a break on the potential economic and productivity gains that can be obtained through digital transformation. The NBN is expected to provide benefits in the order of 1.2 billion per annum, growing to a total of over 10 billion by 2021. Significant productivity gains are likely if NBN pricing supports broader take up of the services. But without affordable broadband, take up will be dampened and these benefits will not be truly realised. For consumers on lower incomes, the cost of communication services can represent a significant proportion of their total income. Households in the lowest 10% and 20% of earners on average pay just over 10% and 6% respectively of their disposable income on communication services. This is well in excess of the average household expenditure on communications services, which accounts for approximately 3.5% of disposable income. The above statistics reflect the exceptionally regressive and inequitable nature of communications expenditure and the significant affordability challenge faced by consumers on low incomes. AKEN's No Australian Left Offline policy proposal addresses this problem. Attaining the full economic benefits of broadband requires steps to be taken to ensure the affordability of services, assisting households through the creation of targeted, conce uh, targeted concessional service will enable Australians to make the most of the opportunities that digital inclusion brings and support equality of access, health, education and employment opportunities. ACAN considers the most effective way to achieve affordable broadband for all Australians is for NBN to offer a 50, 20 megabits per, service per second service for $20 per month available to households receiving financial support for the government. So this would be the wholesale price, $20 per month. We believe that a concessional service at this wholesale level will enable retail service providers to make competitive offerings available to low income consumers and allow consumers to shop around for the best offer for their needs. However, safeguards must be put in place so it is sold as a standalone product for only those that need it. For example, prevent bundling with other services such as content and that the full value of the concession is passed through to consumers. The creation of appropriate safeguards will allow consumers to shop around and for benchmarking of offices, offers in the market to, to preclude potential abuse. ACAN has estimated that there are around 200, 2 million households on the lowest incomes in our community that would stand to benefit significantly if this service was made available on a long-term basis. There also needs to be work done in relation to access to devices and support for installation. Um, and of course, ongoing work um, is currently being done now and needs to be um, to be continued in relation to training and building confidence uh, and building people's digital capability. Uh, and overall, we'll need to make sure that we do track this to make sure that we understand how online, online engagement is going and whether or not all of these measures are actually facilitating the take up that we need. <coughs> Thanks. Thank, um, thank you. Um, colleagues, um, as we know, we, um, we're we going to proceed to questions and um, Ms Templeman, uh, the, the understanding, uh, although I don't think we'll have to rely on it today, given the nature of who's attending, is that we will divide the time uh, equally. I will do my best. I've got a I've got to stop watch here, but no, I don't think we'll get to that level, right? But um, over to you if you uh, want to begin, uh, Ms Templeman, and um, um, if perhaps for the next half an hour at least, if you want to guide the questions uh, involving Mr Farrell, uh, et cetera. Cheers. Uh, and, and look, you know, I think if I do a few questions, John might do some, we might then let you guys and just pick up for the last 10 minutes or whatever, just so it's... Not all sure. about us. Um, thank you. It is great to, um, you know, just get your perspective on all of, all of this. Can I dig a bit deeper into the idea of this concessional plan and how it would work? Um, 
Uh, who would you see as the people most in need of this? I've certainly heard stories in my electorate during COVID of HSC students being without access to broadband. And one of the reasons is cost. Um, and they are really now disadvantaged. So in my mind, I can see a bunch of people, but can you describe in a bit more detail the cohort that you think is being left behind that where this would really um, be a useful uh, policy? You know, we have been working on this policy for a number of years now, and in particular, we launched at the beginning of last year this particular No Australian Left Offline. And of course, that was before any of us envisaged that we would be having a pandemic. Yeah. Um, I'm just hoping that you can hear me because everybody on the screen is frozen. Uh, I can, I'm certainly able to hear. Okay, good. Um, uh, and so, of course, the pandemic has now really highlighted many of the digital divide issues that were existing prior to the pandemic and they've really exacerbated them in lots of ways because of the need to do homeschooling. So our, our work previous to the pandemic showed that families on low incomes were going to be affected more than anyone else because those particular groups were going to be needing it to access education um, and, and ultimately also applying for employment and doing further education and training. Uh, so particularly concerned about households that are families, so multiple users, and also concerned about um, single parents uh, with children as well. So we also think that they are potentially the cohort that have the most to gain by having a good broadband connection. You've mentioned um, people who are looking for work. Obviously, given what we've seen with COVID, there's going to be a large number of people seeking employment. And our at this stage, we all imagine that online is going to be their major focus. Now, my understanding is a lot of people on low incomes are using um, their mobile phone data for internet access, uh, which is obviously a much more expensive way to do it. Do you see that without some sort of um, special concession, that unemployed cohort, over the next however long it is before people can, you know, go by foot to do uh, job interviews and things, that uh, can you see some serious consequences for them? And if so, can you uh, describe for me what, what that might look like based on the research you've done? Sure, absolutely. Well, first and foremost, I was actually at a forum yesterday uh, hosted by the Australian Digital Inclusion Alliance, and uh, it came up very, very clearly that, um, that those who are jobless would be facing new challenges because of having to apply online and, and sit for interviews online when previously um, they may not have even applied for a job for many, many years and may not even have the, the same level of digital skills um, in order to actually um, apply for those jobs effectively. That's even outside of making sure that you've got the right connection. Uh, the Australian Digital Inclusion Index, which is research done by RMIT and Telstra, actually shows that if you are mobile only, you actually have a disadvantage because you are um, having to pay a higher rate for data, um, you won't necessarily have the same coverage um, that you, you know, depending on where you live. And so a fixed service actually does um, serve these kinds of consumers much better. Um, but of course, it is prohibitive if it's um, having to pay for a mobile and a fixed line can be too expensive. And, and of course, quite often because of that, people on lower incomes opt to have only one connection and that usually is their mobile that they choose. And they choose to, to have their mobile being the only connection they have because they also need to be available for the phone calls uh, and because it serves both purposes. I haven't unmuted, have I? My oh. mouth is moving and no words are coming out. <laughs> I'm being married. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask you um, about small business, which is in your submission, you've talked quite a lot about small business um, saying that enterprise grade services don't represent a material value add above residential services for them. Now, again, in COVID, the, the reliance of small business on internet, the number who've finally in embrace the digital world has increased. Uh, can you talk through your findings about small business and the need for 
um, performance guarantees and rectification timelines and, and what part that plays in small businesses' willingness to engage in a higher um, speed broadband product. Absolutely. So, in, in fact, we've recently had some consultation as part of our Small Business Advisory Forum, uh, where we um, involved uh, COSBOA and a number of other organisations that represent small business. Uh, and it became very clear that um, there is a lot of concern by small businesses at the moment that even though um, they have really benefited from the increased bandwidth made available um, during the COVID um, pandemic lockdown period, um, this is the additional 40% that, that MBN has provided, um, they are very concerned about what will happen once this is withdrawn. Because prior to the pandemic, there were a lot of concerns about the type of plans that were available, um, that there wasn't necessarily um, adequate download and upload um, you know, they wanted symmetric services in many instances, not asymmetric. So this is the 50-20. They would rather have 50-50 or, or much higher um, uh, upload speeds, um, not just focusing on the download speed. You know, during the pandemic, we've actually seen, and um, MBN has published these figures, that businesses have, um, have, have um, increased their usage of download by 67% and they're upload by 76% during business hours. That's the increase in traffic that we've seen. So it's significant. Um, and really there isn't enough plans out there that actually have it really clearly stated What's, what additional service level agreement are they actually offering? What additional reliability measures are they offering for a higher price business service? And quite often, as a result of this, particularly small businesses that might be operating from home will opt for a residential service rather than a business grade service because they don't see the difference in um, in, in actually represented and they're paying more, but what are they getting for that? So there needs to be much clearer statement about what um, products are actually out there, much clearer statements by the providers about what they're guaranteeing and what they're not. And is, um, and that's from the provider's perspective. So uh, are you satisfied that what providers can access from NBN does allow them to put together those packages for small business adequately? No, I think we do need to have some improvement there. We do need, there is a need for a diversification of the products that MBN offers. And there's also a need to do a lot more in relation to reliability measures. And um, this was the focus of a recent inquiry, inquiry um, by or um, review by the government um, called Part B, Consumer Safeguards Review, where they looked at reliability. Um, and, and ultimately what we think is that it's not just a case of having the products and services, but also having some regulatory arrangements in place as well that support um, good whole, a good wholesale service standard, for example, um, and that guarantees um, amounts. And, and of course, this would flow through to being then able to develop a diversification of products that actually have a base level built in. All right, look, thank you. That's touched on a few of the issues. I could ask lots more, but I'm going to ask Senator Farrell uh, if he would like to um, spend a, f a few minutes doing some questioning. And he will take himself off mute to do that. And I've, and I've just managed to do that, uh, <coughs> Mrs Templeton. Thank you. Um, yeah, look, I just, um, I'm just a bit interested um, <coughs> In your views about um, perhaps looking looking forward, we we sort of had thought that we got on top of this um, COVID um, issue, um, but in a couple of states, uh, particularly the big the two big states, New South Wales and um, Victoria, we seem to be drifting you know back into fairly significant um, issues um, with sort of no no sort of end in sight. Um, how do you see your members being affected if uh, this, so uh, this this terrible situation continues for um, you know a prolonged period of time, perhaps through until until Christmas? Can you give us a bit of a um, picture on where um, your members sort of see that um, that heading and uh, what we do in those circumstances? Do we have to take some additional measures? Mm. 
Look, the biggest challenge in areas that we're looking at are obviously the people that have not got um, a connection to online services at all, or potentially um, um, may have a service, but isn't it's not an adequate service during this period of time. And so, and and having said that, um, there is a number of things that the um, telecommunications industry has actually been doing, which we really have welcomed. You know, there's been enormous effort. Um, previously to make sure that people were not disconnected for um, for late bill payment, um, possibly due to financial hardship, uh, until those financial hardship arrangements were in place. Um, and there has also been, um, like I said earlier, additional bandwidth, um, and NBN has actually put out a special education targeted product um, to help households that were not connected before the 1st of March. Um, what we see now emerging though, now that we're going into a more long-term um, scenario of having to deal with this pandemic is that we need a lot of these measures to be continued and some of them have been and already and, and extended but the, the extended, extended extensions may need to go into later this year and even early next year and so we'll need to monitor those on an ongoing basis. And also the other thing we've been a bit concerned about is that whilst we've really welcomed the education pa package that MBN has um, put out there, of which we understand at least 6,000 households have benefited to date. Um, it doesn't help somebody who may be connected but struggling to pay and struggling to, to stay connected. Um, it doesn't necessarily um, assist somebody who, um, who can't get their NBN connection in place in time. Uh, and so there does need to be, you know, additional um, thought given to what interim services need to be provided. And of course, we do need to focus more particularly on those that are in education and making sure that those kids can get their um, access their their schooling um, and I'm just conscious of the fact that um, that Una might want to add something in here and or to the, any of the previous questions and I, I didn't sort of throw to her to give her an opportunity well thank you Theresa. I, I think just, just in response to this particular question um, I'd, I'd also add that there's a real concern for older people. Um, who uh, are obviously very, very affected by the lockdown and very concerned about um, the contagion effect. Um, and their ability to go and seek medical advice face to face is, is severely impaired. Um, so it's very important for them to access telehealth services and obviously particularly important for people in, in non-metro areas as well to continue to have access to services as much as possible. Um, without having to um, go into affected areas. Just just on that topic of the tele um, services, can you give us um, some indi indication of um, how you see that um, operating in in the current circumstances, and um, whether, firstly, <clears throat> we're likely to see a, an increase in in the usage of the, in that area and if you can give us some indication of what you believe that to be so, but whether or not this offers an opportunity for a long, long, longer term uh, service, particularly uh, for older people, particularly for people in uh, in regional areas that don't always have access to or easy access to medical services. Sorry, I missed um, a part of the question you did drop out. Was that specifically in relation to the current no. MBN. Yeah. Yes. So, so what I guess what I'm asking uh, about is a bit more information about the um, the telemedicine um, services mm -hmm. that are being operated um, yep. at the yep. present time, and how how you think that's working, and how you think it might sort of work into the into the into the future. Um, particularly for older Australians, particularly for those sort of in, in regional areas, and uh, whether or not we should be um, developing some po policies to promote and encourage that type of uh, service. Yeah, sure. Uh, look, we absolutely support telehealth, and we're very pleased with the measures that have been taken um, to open up telehealth across the board, uh, particularly in general practice. Um, previously, it was um, quite widely used for specialists in rural and regional areas, specialist services. So it's been um, excellent to see it open up more broadly. I believe the biggest take up 
has actually been in relation to, to, to phone consults um, rather than necessarily using MBN services. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that that won't change over time um, because, of course, um, you know, some of the, the most developed areas for, for telehealth, particularly in rural areas, have been mental health services. Um, so I, I would really like to see these continued and over time I think that we'll see that um, more people will be using them. Um, I think that uh, there is still quite a bit of education that's needed for seniors to come to, to, to come to grips with these new options and to feel comfortable with them. Um, but I think overall um, we've, we've seen um, a change that could have taken a decade um, really leap forward and, and take a period of months and, and weeks um, instead. And it really has been essential. Um, having said that, I know that there has been commentary in the media from um, some doctors who feel that um, there needs to be a balance, of course, um, and, uh, you know, that, that there are limitations in it. So I think, you know, it's a case of, of um, it's very good now have this option. It's not the, it doesn't serve everybody's need, um, but in, in a situation where we have to social distance, um, it has been an, an absolutely excellent thing that we've been able to, to implement telehealth services to the degree that we have. All right, thank you. Um, that's all the questions I have at the moment, uh, Chair. Uh, Chair, I note that um, Brian um, has just joined us. Mr Mitchell's joined us. I'm not sure, Mr Mitchell, whether you would like to do so, uh, uh, use the rest of the time now for questioning or, or settle in and see what's been covered and we'll come back to you. I think best of all, just settle in. Thank you, Deputy Chair. <laughs> okay, then Chair, we'll hand back to you. Thank you very much. Best of luck settling in, Mr Mitchell. Um, <laughs> if I, I might start before I um, um, send a Davy uh, and send a um, uh, Ms. Corbin, thank you uh, for your submission and for um, being available this morning. Um, I'm just interested about a few things. First, your submission talks about. Um, well, suggests that the take up of MBN has been lacklustre. I think that was your choice of phrase. Um, I'm really keen to know what you're basing that on, um, particularly against the background where uh, at least I'm aware that MBN is on target to re take up of between 73 and 75%, and I'm sure you're aware of that as well. So, so just what you're basing the the, the, the lack of the suggestion on. Okay, look, I don't um, deny the fact that MBN is meeting its targets and nor um, would I suggest that, um, that you know, it's, we're in a, you know, absolutely terrible situation in relation to MBN, we're not. Um, however, uh, we do believe that in order to reap the full benefit of the economic investment that has been put in to the MBN by the government, that we need to make sure that all Australians are online. And uh, this actually sort of is really um, being shown up in the last few months um, because it's been highlighted that in fact, um, people are choosing sometimes a mobile service over an MBN service and it's not necessarily the right service for them, that a fixed service would have been better during this period. Um, and so I, I think, and also because there's still a significant number of households um, that have um, not made the shift yet. So even though um, we have the rollout is largely complete, um, uh, well, it, complete except for the difficult installations that and, and areas, some, some areas that were always going to take a little bit longer, the actual take up, even though we've gone past all the households, the actual take up could be much higher. And we have a concern that um, that as 5G rolls out, that that will actually start to eat into um, the, the revenue base for MBN and the potential number of connections. And the, the reason that we're concerned about that is because we actually think that um, it's really important that 
that MBN's economic model is successful because ultimately we need to be able to reinvest and invest into the infrastructure of MBN on an ongoing basis as technology changes, as we need more speed um, and better services, um, as we need to upgrade things like satellites and fixed wireless services um, need to be expanded. We need to have a revenue base and an income base for MBN to actually do that. And so that's the, the context within which we make those comments. Um, not um, hopefully not to read too much into the lacklustre, but that, that's the angle that we're, we're looking at it from. You need to, you need to unmute. Three. Um, uh, I, obviously, my computer's not linked to this thing, so... Um, but you, you, in saying that, you accept that MBNs on targets have three out of every four Australians um, connected. But you say that you know the the aim ought to be uh, all Australians online, which um, is a lofty goal. I've got to tell you. <laughs> I, don't know if you've, I don't know if you've met my father, but he's never going online. <laughs> yes. Well. I, we accept that that is a lofty goal. Um, consumer organisations often do aim high, um, and ultimately, I guess the reality is that you know it may well be that there are some seniors that that don't necessarily choose to have an internet connection, but um, as they're living at home in the long term, they could well have health services that are using a broadband connection. So whilst they're they're not necessarily um, using the internet they will ultimately be using broadband services, broadband enabled services, and we want to make sure that they can. Uh, excellent. Can I just um, go to um, questions around return on investment? You mentioned it there. Uh, obviously, there's a need for that in order for the network to be reinvested in. Um, th there's got to be a fine balance struck, doesn't there, between um, MBN Co, um, providing an affordable service uh, and achieving a return on him. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can you tell me, you know, in what you think in terms of um, or what what or what ACAN proposes in relation to finding or striking that fine balance? Yes, so I think that is uh, reasonable, and that's uh, why we've been very specific about a targeted uh, concessional service that it would need to be um, obviously on a needs basis. So if you're on income support, then you would qualify for it. Um, clearly, there also needs to be some more work done around that. For example, some households, um, you know, an unemployed um, young person may be living with their parents. They may not need um, assistance um, for their internet connection. Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, it, we've done a projection saying that we believe two million households could um, benefit from um, some kind of assistance. Um, the actual number is actually um, not really clear. It's very hard to know. There are also, even though we know there are a lot of people that are waged poor, we're just about to put out some research on this. We know that, um, that they, they may well still be struggling to pay for an internet connection or a mobile um, service ongoing. So, you know, we do understand that there does need to be a bit more work done around this to make sure that it is quite targeted, because what we're proposing, and we've been very careful to say this, what we're proposing is not meant to uh, dig into the revenue base of, of, of or the economic uh, model that MBN has been um, built upon, because ultimately um, we do live in a very large country. We need to support services for rural and regional and remote consumers, and they are quite costly. Um, the, the regional broadband scheme that's really recently been adopted by government um, is, is definitely a big assistance in that regard. But on an ongoing basis, we need to make sure that as many people as possible are connected to the MBN, um, playing the standard rates. And then what we want to see is that that should be able to, to assist with the concessional rate. And we ultimately think that it's not just, um, even though MBN is looking into these concessional services and seeing what they can do, and of course they're offering on an interim basis, on a short-term basis, these educational packages during the COVID period. Um, I'll, uh, in, in the long term, we think that the government will probably have to provide some assistance to MBN in order to make sure that everyone's connected. We think that that works because of the fact that, in actual fact, the government saves a lot when they're not um, providing face-to-face -face transactions and they're providing online transactions. So that's why, why we talk about, you know, really 
you know, meet, really getting the full economic benefit out of our investment in, in MBN, uh, basically making sure everybody's in line, we make the savings that the government needs to make across um, all services in all areas um, that are providing services online. I don't know, Yuna, did you want to add anything to that? No, I, I think that's very comprehensive and it's very much our view. Um, can I take you back to take up? Um, is AKIN aware um, of any difference between MBN take up from your members between ret metro regional ready to connect areas and across technology types? Uh, and secondly, on that, um, how do you think that 5G will impact the take up rates um, and market competition? Okay, <clears throat> so I don't know the specific um, percentages or numbers off the top of my head for regional versus metropolitan take up. Um, however, um, we do know that regional take up is different because of the fact that um, they will, in, in many areas where it's a fixed wireless or a satellite connection, then those um, customers, those consumers, those households uh, will not lose their copper connection if they have one. Um, and so this means that um, there is greater incentive for metropolitan users to switch over to MBN because they're being given a, a, a window within which they must switch over even if they want to continue their phone services. Uh, so that will affect in the long run um, the percentages of, of people that are connected. And we do have quite a bit to say about um, people in regional areas that, um, that may not have switched over because they, they quite like their ADSL services that are provided over the copper network. Uh, and that their ADSL service is serving them okay. Um, we believe there's upwards of 420,000 consumers or households still using ADSL. That was figures from last year. Um, and, you know, there is some concern that, you know, perhaps even the MBN network may not well be in, in those areas uh, with fixed phone, fixed line, sorry, fixed wireless services, that they may not be able to take the, the full capacity of all of those services switching over. But there's also a concern about those ADSL services future because um, it's not clear that, um, well, in fact, Telstra has no obligation to continue them. Tel Telstra has an obligation to continue a voice service over copper, but not a data service. And so um, some people who've had some problems with those ADSL services haven't necessarily been able to get those issues rectified. Um, and there has been ongoing um, concerns there. Um, we also feel that um, the satellite services, so SkyMuster, um, has not been taken up as much as it could have been taken up. Um, there's still a lot of, um, a lot of consumers that um, are choosing to use, to continue to use a mobile service, a mobile broadband service, a lot of misunderstanding that they might be able to save money and a lot of un, uh, misunderstanding that the services have over time tr changed and improved, that there are more product options and more data available now. And so there's quite a lot of um, work being done to try and promote the SkyMaster services um, better in regional areas. Um, you know, did you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I think I'd, I'd just add that um, our understanding is that the take up, um, not surprisingly, has increased significantly um, since the COVID uh, lockdown. Um, we understand it's about 600,000 services that have been signed up um, over NBN since it started. So, um, so obviously, as, as Theresa mentioned earlier, it's been a catalyst for, for everybody having to go online and the, the, uh, the, this increased sign up to NBN as well. Excellent. I might pass over to Senator Davey. Uh, thank you, and actually thank you for introducing my um, what I'm really interested in, because it is the take-up of SkyMuster in regional areas. I know uh, in the early days, SkyMuster had, um, to be polite, a few teething issues. And do you think that and the reputation of that is also, is also leading to the lack of take-up of SkyMuster services in the region? Unfortunately, yes. Um, 
it, it is unfortunate um, because there has been a lot of work done, um, not just by MBN, but also regional communities have put a lot of effort into consulting with MBN. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of the Better Internet for Rural Regional and Remote Consumers, um, BUR, as they're um, better known as. Um, it's a Facebook community and um, a lot of volunteers that help um, people get connected. But uh, the, the, the people driving that particular group have really engaged very strongly with MBN and, and got some good outcomes in relation to better products. So Sky Must Plus, which um, has some free metered so, uh, sites and also increased data amounts. Um, and also um, edu better education services um, have resulted, um, uh, particularly for those who are doing remote schooling. Uh, and um, during the COVID period, there's a doubling of data on the standard SkyMaster um, plans, um, which has also been excellent. Um, there's also been quite a lot of work done in better communication about outages. You know, it's inevitable that with any service there are going to be outages, but it's important if they're planned outages that these things are communicated well um, to the community beforehand. Uh, and particularly a community that may not be able to find out um, when the outage is already on because they can't connect. Um, and so those are those that are in very remote areas that don't even have a mobile connection or even, even any sort of fixed line connection that they could phone their neighbours and find out what, what's happening and why they can't connect. Um, the biggest difficulty with any sort of internet um, connection or, M, you know, this pertains to MBN and every, every internet, is that often the consumer assumes that, um, you know, they, they, they know what the problem is, but it could be anything along the chain that's affecting the service. And so that makes it very difficult to troubleshoot. A lot of people are becoming very savvy about this now, and this is what the Better Internet for Rural, Real, Regional and Remote group uh, really assists with. Um, I think that um, Una probably would want to um, um, add something. She's done a lot of work with rural, regional and remote consumers. Um, yeah, I really just, um, I, I, I think that there's been a considerable reluctance to take up SkyMaster because of past experience with satellite internet connectivity. Um, and as you say, Senator Daly, the, um, the early days of SkyMaster um, were, were not good. Um, and I, the, the deterrent effect has been huge. Um, so there's been a lot of resistance there. Um, the, also the limited data allowances has, has been a problem and, and MBN has definitely worked pretty hard to address this um, in relation to bringing in the SkyMaster Plus service, which has been excellent. Um, affordability is a big problem in regional Australia and remote Australia. Um, so we, we know that this is something that also affects services. The, the SkyMaster, um, the, the basic SkyMaster is a sort of comparable price to an urban internet connection, but when you get into the kind of higher higher level plans, then they can be pretty pricey. Um, but um, even, a, even a basic plan can be, um, you know, quite out of reach of a low income household in the regions. Um, probably also just add that, um, the SkyMaster services have off-peak and on-peak rates of data, and this can be a little bit of a turn. Well, it can be a turn-off for people, um, and they, you know, can see this as a negative, even though um, overall they're still getting a SkyMaster connection than paying for an expensive mobile um, where the data is is limited. Um, and I should declare that I am a SkyMaster Plus customer, but <laughs> but the information that you put on Hansard is really good because not everyone around the country is. Um, but I, I do understand the differential pricing and the fact that uh, some of the more comprehensive SkyMaster services are significantly more uh, costly than a similar um, fixed line service in an urban or urban environment. Um, so that brings me to further, I want to further delve into your concept of the concessional um, offerings, particularly for low income households. Would Do you think that uh, a concessional service should just be the basic service? Um, because every, every household and their needs are different, but it's also mm -hmm. how much should um, be subsidised. Yeah. Okay. So we haven't based it on the the slowest possible um, speed, um, but of course, you know, SkyMaster is limited in relation to speed. So um, you know, 
another reason why we've chosen the 2050 as an option um, that everybody can be provided with and that also um, uh, we believe that a household of multiple users will benefit um, adequately to do education. Um, you know, of course, you know, maybe you won't be able to have multiple people um, streaming Netflix um, at the same time, um, but we do believe that that, that speed that we've um, that we've um, suggested is the is the right speed to enable people to do education and telehealth, apply for jobs, um, do video conferencing as they need um, for work um, or other purposes. Um, so we think we think that's the right speed. Um, and you know, over time, obviously that may need to you know be um, reconsidered in the you know in a few years time. But that's the we think that's an adequate speed at the moment. And uh, how do you see the system working, given that the NBN is a wholesaler, so they they develop the product and they sell it on to the retailers, how do you see a concessional product um, flowing through that multi-layer system? And also, you know, I would imagine we would have to have some level of enforcement to ensure the end retailer is actually providing the concessional product to mm -hmm. the low-income households. I'm just interested in yeah, how you yeah. see that. You're sure. Um, so we've had quite a few discussions with um, retail service providers as well as MBN about our concept. Um, and so, yes, of course, you would need to make sure that you have um, some kind of eligibility. So we think that um, if you um, are in receipt of um, a government um, income support, um, option, you know, disability pension, um, job seeker, um, you know, pension, old age pension, um, wh whichever um, benefit you may be receiving, that you would receive a discount code that you would use. And this has been, this kind of system has been used before um, by providers and they feel that it would be relatively straightforward to implement. And of course, and basically what would happen is each time you go to um, put in your pay your bill, you'd supply the code and um, that would show that you're still el eligible um, for the service. Um, so, you know, of course we have, you know, thought about, you know, well, how, how much compliance and how much cost would it, would it be to actually implement. But the retail ser service providers that we've spoken to have been very supportive because overall they think that this will actually enhance the take up of MBN services. So they think overall there's a better um, outcome um, for um, for um, for consumers. We also like this option um, better than um, just perhaps another possibility would have been to give an, give an allowance and add it to any kind of income support. The problem with an allowance is that it doesn't necessarily link it directly to the policy outcome that you want, which in this case is MBN take up. Um, so that's why we believe it's much better after doing quite a lot of consultation about this model, um, it would be much better to actually have this concessional rate um, that is you know, specifically targeted at specific groups. Um, because then, like I said earlier, you, you're getting the, the benefit to the economy that you want, which is people being able to access training, education opportunities, employment opportunities and the rest. Um, the other thing too, um, ultimately, is that um, if, if MBN is providing a concessional rate and a product, then several RSPs, several retail service providers can take it up and then we actually get the situation of actually having some competition in this market in the low end, um, low um, end of the market, and that's much better for consumers overall too. Um, thank you. I, and just a final question from me, Chair. You mentioned earlier um, that the regional broadband scheme goes some way to sort of um, balancing, but I know in your submission that the postage stamp concept it doesn't address the low income household areas that you're interested in but i'd also like to get your opinion on um, what you think of the statutory infrastructure provider obligations that have now been introduced and whether you think that that will go uh, some way to alleviating the concerns out there that people are going to be left in limbo once the NBN rollout is finished. Absolutely. Well, we've been very supportive from the from the very start when we saw this legislation um, of the statutory infrastructure provider. Um, 
and of it being MBN, um, because ultimately uh, we have a universal service obligation that really only covers voice services. We need something that covers data as well, and this goes quite a, a significant way towards doing that. And it will ensure that even if you have your house has not been connected in the uh, rollout that's been happening now, you can actually get a service after that rollout is complete because there there is this um, there's now this uh, guarantee that that you can um, ask you know for a broadband connection um, and get it, um, which is fantastic. But the other thing we really like about the statutory infrastructure provider concept is that and, and the legislation around it, it introduces the um, a de definition of basic broadband the first time and a speed. And it also um, links uh, service standards with those. So we've got the beginnings of some consumer protection safeguards uh, that um, are built around that statutory infrastructure provider um, concept and, and about around MBN provision. And so all of those things are very good for consumers. Uh, thanks, Chair. I might come back later. But... Can't hear you, Tony. He looked frozen. I think um, Senator Antic had some questions. Um, yeah, I, I did. I, if that's all right with the um, committee, I might just ask my question. Thank you, Senator Davey. Um, look, my question um, relates to um, in addition to today's uh, Comms Day uh, article or um, the newsletter, which um, highlights, I think, that Australia's performance against um, 85 measured countries on the Global Digital Quality of Life Index. Um, and the report found that Australia was ranked 15th for internet affordability. Now, those um, findings seem consistent with the ACCC's findings that the average price of MBN services have been trending down since 2015. I'm just looking for comment about that. Yeah, so we don't dispute um, those findings. In a, in, in a lot of respects, we have noted that the prices overall are going down, and, and this is a measure of um, having competition in the, in the marketplace. What our concern is that when we looked at household expenditure overall and the um, other things that households are paying for and how much communications is a significant part for low-income consumers and also our, uh, basing it on the number of low-income households that are actually not connected. Um, to us, that's enough of an evidence base that even in a competitive market that is driving prices down uh, in the long term, it's not driving them down far, fast enough for this particular group and that ultimately that the cost to all of us of not having people connected because of the, an affordability barrier is too great and that we have to act sooner than waiting in the long term for prices to come down. Um, you know, maybe we will be in a situation in, you know, 10 years time where we look back and, and say, well, we don't need these measures anymore, but we definitely need them now. Uh, thank you. Uh, we've got the chair back. Um, Yes, and Durantic, I'm Thank you. here. I, I think as we experienced last time, once you're thrown off the tele, uh, so the video conference can't get back on, um, I'll try and continue to manage uh, it over the phone line. But uh, if you want to continue, Senator Antic? Well, I, I think uh, I'm, that's probably my only question, Chair. Um, okay, so um, to you, Dr. Allen. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, thank you um, very much, um, Ms. Corbin, uh, I've got a question regarding your submission. Um, it references the Infrastructure Australia Telecommunication Audit, um, saying that this is disproportionately more expensive by low-income households on telecommunication services. Um, in that report on page 585, that data is referenced back to ACAN, which is you, I think. Is that correct? Your Australian Communications yes. Action yes. Network? Yes. Um, yes. So, and, and when I look to your website reference, uh, it's referencing data based on 2015 to 2016 ABS data. So the yep. data is now five years old, and I think in 2010, about less than 10% of Australians are actually using or connected to the NBN. So do you think it's valid that this data reflects the NBN experience of 2020, or, or have you done a more mm -hmm. recent survey that's updating that? 
So the more recent uh, statistics that we've been using come from the Department of Communications. It's still 2017 data. Um, and it still reflects a very people? similar Sorry. level. Sorry, Sorry, just to say, if, if, was, if NBN was 2016, there was 10% of Australians were actually connected. In 2017, yeah. what percentage of Australians were actually connected at that time? Hang on, I'm just finding it a bit hard to hear you. So, um, it's just about the percentage. You're just trying to understand the, re the reflection of the true uptake um, compared to, you know, it's been an accelerated connection. So 2015, 2016, 2017, the connections were low and it's now obviously much higher in 2020. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't actually know that statistic off the, off um, hand right now, but um, I'm happy to take that question on notice and, and follow through um, to find out the latest data for you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just reading a note here. Um, uh, Mr. Simmons was with us for a brief while, but um, he's I'm ready, not. I'm ready to jump in, Chair, if you're. If you're yep, I think that might be a good approach, Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, over to you. Thank you. Um, th thank you for your testimony. Um, I'm, I apologise, I wasn't here for the first half hour, so if these have been asked already, I do apologise. Um, during COVID-19, uh, what, what are consumers telling you about the ability to access MBN uh, and RSPs as companies? Uh, uh, have there been access issues in terms of communication? So there's been a very mixed bag in relation to this. So first and foremost, I should say that most people have been very pleased with the additional bandwidth that um, that MBN has provided and has been uh, to the RSPs, the retail service providers, and then has actually flowed through and meant that you know a lot, many people have had a smoother experience than they may have given the enormous overnight take up and increase of traffic uh, on the MBN and on broadband. Um, so you know we've we've uh, overall the, the the vast majority of people have been um, very. Um, very, very pleased with their services. That's not to say that there hasn't been, you know, days when there was the intermittent um, issues. Um, obviously, it's always difficult to identify uh, where the problems are. Um, there was a report that's just come out by the TIO, the Telecommunications Industry Ombudsman, um, in relation to the pandemic um, and um, the impact of that on telecommunications and the types of systemic issues that. Um, that they um, have um, identified and we're happy to send through the link for that report because there's um, um, a very detailed analysis of case studies um, of people that did experience difficulties. Um, the biggest concern um, in actual fact uh, related to the call centres that um, people were trying to access, you know, um, to try and, you know, fix problems when they had problems or find out um, how to pay a bill with, that they couldn't pay and whether they could get extensions, all that sort of um, terrible situation that arose. And the biggest problem was the fact that um, many of the telcos have overseas call centres and most of those call centres overseas were affected um, in the Philippines and India. Um, and had to shut down um, due to their own lockdowns and, and um, much more stringent lockdowns than we've seen in Australia. Yeah. Um, and I'm, they, I'm, they I'm didn't get much yeah. notice. Yeah, and I'm, I'm aware those telcos are bringing a lot of that back on shore. But do you think they've been respons responsive enough uh, and quickly enough uh, for, you know, to deal with these issues? I mean, uh, I'm aware of my electorate of people who've tried to contact one of, one of the major RSPs um, mm. And they've just, you know, and they've even gone into the bricks and mortar stores, and the, even mm. the staff in there have been unable to help. They, they just, you know, yeah. throw their hands up and say, "We can't get information from our own yeah. company." Um, so, what yeah. more could the telcos be doing to be more responsive to consumer needs? Yeah, look, I think there uh, definitely uh, has been a lot of confusion at times, and um, clearly there hasn't been always great communication inside the telcos. If people did have um, problems that wasn't easy to resolve them um, because of the fact that so much of the so many of the resources of the companies were being taken up by you know um, by because of the pandemic, um, the other problem that we've had is people who've wanted to get a new connection um, and have wanted to get MBN because really suddenly they realised they needed to needed the faster connection 
um, but weren't able to get it um, very quickly or in fact may have been in um, areas that were difficult to connect and um, weren't ready for service yet. Uh, so those were the kinds of problems. I might just hand to you know, Lawrence to see if she has anything to add. Um, yeah, I, just a few just a few more comments. Um, MBN has been um, staying in touch with us because they, they certainly experienced some um, delays in getting equipment to the right place at the right time. Um, just in relation to Theresa's earlier comments. So there were some logistical problems um, that were caused by the lockdown. Um, and then obviously some communities were in lockdown themselves, so it was very difficult to get access. But it did mean that there was quite a backlog of, of new connection and fault repair issues that, that we were aware of. Um, and in relation to the um, retail service provider issues, we, we have been similarly concerned that some, we, we know that some providers in particular are, um, have experienced huge problems. Um, and um, we, we very encourage that um, there seems to be a move to bring call centres back, back on, on, on into Australia. Um, that seems to be a, a really good solution that will help, help consumers on many levels. I mean, consumers have had concerns even before the pandemic about the difficulty of, you know, contacting uh, telcos, whether it's MBN or the RSPs, uh, for helpful information, you know, you know person to person. It's, it's been a very convoluted process. And with the mm -hmm. call centres having, you know, gone down overseas, it's been nigh on impossible. Are you satisfied from a consumer point of view that the telcos have got it right in their model of communication with consumers in the first place. I mean, uh, I hear what you're saying, that you're pleased that the call centres are coming back on shore, um, but yeah. uh, is that just domesticating, you know, w w what's a, a failing system in the first place? Do we need a new model of, for these telcos to be able to you know, interact with consumers and be more responsive to their needs? Yeah, so there has been a lot of um, focus on this over many years. You know, customer service is an ongoing, as you pointed out, an ongoing um, bane for consumers. The biggest problem, even after you get in contact with um, with the provider um, and perhaps get an agreement with them that something's going to happen, is then actually having that action taken, um, which seems like a crazy kind of complaint to have, but um, they are often the biggest area of complaint to the, the ombudsman. Um, for so what, what, needs to happen, what needs to happen to fix that? Do you have any specific ideas on uh, how that can be addressed? Yeah, so we would like to see more benchmarks in relation to customer service, and we've we have actually asked for that in the past. You know, um, you know how we've asked for you know uh, there to be a limit as to how long you would wait on the phone, um, and we've asked for you know there to be um, you know more requirements in relation to um, complaint handling overall. Um, there ha is now a complaint handling standard, which is much a much improved situation. But I think it's important to note that during this period, um, the um, regulator has chosen to have some regulatory forbearance on some areas um, of um, regulation, which means that um, they have relaxed some of their requirements because of the overseas call centre issue. Um, Long term, we would still we still would maintain that um, there needs to be a very high level of consumer protection in relation to complaint handling, and it needs to be linked to um, proper enforcement and proper um, uh, you know ability to actually act very quickly um, by the regulator because we think that would actually improve the the um, willingness of the of the RSPs to invest in their customer service. Um, and there's actually a consultation paper at the moment out um, by the Department of, of Communication, or it's not Department of Communications anymore, it's Department of Infrastructure, Regional Development, and I can't remember the rest of the name of that, the that, department. That's okay. Who can keep up? Um, Look, just, anyways, just and they're perhaps on looking the at um, enforcement and regulation in the telecommunications area and whether or not that needs to be strengthened. Oh, just quickly, you mentioned the regulator and how the pretty much get out of jail free car because of the pandemic. Are you satisfied from the consumer point of view that that was the right move? Uh, we actually didn't support all of the um, regulatory forbearance because um, particularly from the small business con perspective, um, our members were very concerned that, um, that you know, consumer protection shouldn't be relaxed, that if there was individual circumstances 
that it was much better to actually look at those individual situations rather than relax them across the board. And the reason that they felt that was because they did not want, um, they, they felt that, you know, already there was challenges, as you've pointed out, um, and challenges that they were, you know, um, concerned about for good reason. Thank you. Now, um, just a couple more, Chair, for me, if that's all right. Um, sure. are, you aware, are you aware of developers uh, failing to install MBN boxes onto new builds in new development estates, which then leads to new homeowners having to, uh, you know, after the, after the purchase, uh, organise all that themselves, which, of course, leads to what I would suggest are unnecessary delays and perhaps even increased costs. Do you, have, do you get much on that? You know, have we had any consumer contacts about that specific issue? Um, no, not, not specifically um, in relation to that. But one of the issues that, that we've been concerned about for a while is the, the charge of a connection um, in a new development. It's quite, uh, quite an expensive um, extra charge that the household has to pay in order to get an MBN connection. So we have been very concerned about that. Um, but when you say quite expensive, can you are you able to uh, allocate it's a couple of hundred dollars, I believe. Yeah, a, a couple, yeah. I mean, but yeah, all right. but that's yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, I mean, when that sort of fee is just lumped on top of a three hundred thousand dollar bill price, I'm not sure I'd yeah. agree that it's a, a massive impost. But the feedback I get to some of the new estates going up in my area are that. They, uh, the developers aren't putting them on because they're not they're not required by law to do so, um, and so that the, the homeowners just assume that it's that they've got MBN, and by the time they get into the house, they realise they haven't. They've got to go through it all themselves. And mm. look, and this is only anecdotal. I've not been able to get it to substan substantiated, but that in areas where they would expect to have uh, fibre to the node. Um, you know, because the infrastructure is in the area, in the estate, because the MBM box is not on their house and connected to the meter and etc., um, that they are that they are instead, when the homeowner comes along, they're going onto a fixed wireless service to a nearby tower, which then I think places unnecessary congestion pressure on the tower. So, I'm not, but you've not heard any of this. Um, look, the um, the obligation on MBN is to provide the infrastructure, but then the, the difficulty is that the service has to be ordered by the customer, by the household. Um, it has to be, the order has to be placed through the retailer. So, um, I, you know, that's just the, the nature of the relationships and the structure of the industry. Um, so the, the, I appreciate that people would find it really frustrating if they've been misled into believing that there's an active MBN connection um, and it's all done when they move into a new development. That would be really unfortunate, um, and, and you know there, there would be definite issues there. Um, but but in relation to um, the actual ordering of the service, I think it would be quite difficult because you wouldn't necessarily want to move into a place and have all that uh, done and dusted when it's not really suited to your needs. It would it would you know the the, the, the reverse side of that could be it would be an unnecessary impost. Uh, all right, um, and one last one, Chair. Thank you. Uh, sure. Uh, do, do you believe the consumer protections? Protect. Sorry, let me start again. Do you believe the consumer protections and obligations uh, are strong enough on telcos? Uh, and I come to a uh, an area of my electorate called Lackland, which is a little town outside of New Norfolk. Um, they are on fixed wireless, and they've had just you know trouble for years trying to get decent fixed wireless service. Then the NBN, to its credit, has increased the sales um, and done a number of things to try and jerry-rig a solution. But this, the problems are ongoing. So people are paying for a service out there. They're not receiving it. And they're not receiving what they're paying for. You know, what, what, are, what are the consumer protection measures required to ensure that Australians receive the broadband they pay, and de they pay for and deserve? Um, okay, so there's a number of things, including that um, obviously consumer law applies. If you're paying for a service you're not getting, then you're entitled to refunds. Um, but of course, it's up to the consumer to um, actually, you know, act on that and 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 follow that up with their retail service provider. Um, recently, more recently than that, so 2018, there are a number of additional standards that were brought in place uh, in relation to. Um, 
to uh, checking your line speed so that make sure that you know if you make a request for that 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 should happen um, and also obviously the complaint handling standard um, that did put in place um, the number of days and and whatnot to resolve issues notwithstanding that it's still a very difficult situation for consumers to resolve issues because there are multiple parties involved um, and when it comes to you know fixed wireless congestion whilst we've seen some response from MBN like you said of you know increasing um, the, the amount of bandwidth this is an ongoing issue that we um, have some concern about and we would like to see um, more um, a, a much quicker response um, from MBN, obviously that involves, um, you know, rolling out um, their increased bandwidth faster. Um, but also, um, we would like to see, you know, where possible, if it's if it's possible to build out the fibre network a bit further in some areas, and that would also um, be be better for some of those consumers. So, and 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 from my understanding, that is the plan over time. It's just that we have no transparency about that. So beyond beyond, you know, I mean, we can all have guidelines and you know best practice models and those sorts of things but beyond those I mean what specific structures are needed to essentially you know uh, compel NBN and, and the RSPs to provide the broadband that people expect and that they're, they're paying for I mean I hear what you're saying that you know people yeah. can uh, seek a yeah, refund sure. on if they're getting crappy NBN but they don't they, want a, yeah, they don't sure. want a refund they want to be able to you know watch yeah. TV and watch you know, so, and use the internet Sure. So we've actually proposed that there needs to be a customer service guarantee on data, uh, so broadband, not just on the fixed telephone services that we have, the legacy telephone services, and that this would actually mandate and have um, have mandate timeframes. So for when how how quickly something has to be rectified, repaired, connected if it's a new connection, um, and that if appointments aren't, aren't met, that there would be compensation that should be paid. And at the moment, um, there are arrangements in place and, and currently under review at the wholesale level between MBN and the retail service providers in regards to this, but they're not, there's nothing that um, is a pass through onto the consumers. There's no requirement for the consumers. And there's certainly nothing that they can say that they understand and say, look, I want you to, you know, give me my, my service guarantee in relation to broadband. We, we really want to see this, this, this happen um, because we think that would actually improve, that would improve the situation um, quite markedly because there would be an incentive uh, for issues to be resolved much quicker. So I've heard you refer to that uh, service obligation a couple of times now. So, in, without wanting to put words in your mouth, is that the um, excuse me, is that the number one uh, consumer protection measure that you see as the, the most important thing to get to achieve? In regards to reliability, absolutely. Right. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, before we uh, go on, I think Ms. Templeman, we might. Um, and, and, um, we might share some time going forward. Uh, I'll hand over to you and then uh, we might round out with some coalition uh, members. Just a question. I, I take it um, by my calculation we have a, another 70 minutes in total if we need them. Is that, is that right, Lee, at the Secretariat? That's correct. Excellent. Um, over to you, um, Susan. Thank you. Um, so there's just, uh, listening to all of that's been really useful. So a whole lot of different things have, have um, sort of come through. So it'll go back to some of the issues we've touched on uh, in some of my questions. But one is just about the bushfires. And I've been listening to you talk about um, the resilience of the network and the responsiveness uh, when things go wrong. I just wondered from a consumer education and I guess service resilience perspective, what would the key learnings have been out of the, the bushfires, which have got a little bit swamped by COVID, but um, I'm curious as to what we learnt and what you saw from that period. Has Teresa dropped out? Yes, she might have. I think she may have. Um, look, I'll, I'll, I'll um, kick off on this. The, um, 
Um, she, Theresa herself has also done a lot of work on it, so um, I, but, but I'll try to kind of fill in the, the gaps here. Um, the key learnings that, that we've we've really really identified is, as you say, um, the need for resilience services. Um, so that means the need for kind of backup where possible. Um, the need for um, uh, the, uh, uh, particularly in relation to mobile towers and access to fuel. Um, the, but because um, telecommunication services don't don't have the, the sort of emergency service um, high um, categorisation, um, they're not um, they're not able to get access priority access to diesel fuel um, in emergencies to um, oh, Theresa's back now, which is good. But they're not. I'll, I'll just finish the point I'm making. Um, um, telecommunication services aren't, aren't permitted to get priority access to fuel. To, to restore emergency power um, as a high priority to mobile mobile network um, infrastructure. Um, this is something that, that really came into, into, into the spotlight during the bushfire crisis because it meant a, a quite significant delay in getting those services restored. Um, Teresa, I'll hand this over to you now, now you're back. Did, did you hear the question? They only got as far as bushfires and not the question. <laughs> bushfires and what were the things we've learned that need to be done from an NBN perspective? Oh. Although, you know, what I saw, just picking up on what we've just heard, in my area, power went out, so people yeah. lost their broadband. If they had broadband, um, they lost mm. it and they relied on the mobile network. The mobile towers went down uh, and there wasn't diesel for backup and things. So, yeah. you know, how do we, uh, you know, what did we see? What did we learn? What yeah. did we need to fix? Yeah. So, I mean, I've kind of been doing this for a number of years now. So I've seen, unfortunately, several seasons of terrible bushfires and, and what's happened each time. And in, in some respects, I must admit, whilst we've been very, very concerned about the impact of power going down, one of the things that did come up this time um, that wasn't really available previously in um, the recovery phase was the Skymaster trucks um, being able to set up Wi-Fi, um, you know, little Wi-Fi network um, impromptu as soon as they could get the trucks into a community. Um, and one of the things that's been a learning that's come from this is that um, that and, and the government has now allocated some funding for this, um, that um, NBN is going to set up the Skymaster equipment at evacuation centres on a permanent basis. Of course, not all the time, but it will be turned on when they become evacuation centres, not just for bushfires, but any sort of um, natural disaster, including floods, um, of which we have, you know, in different areas every year. Um, so that was a, a very big learning. And the other thing that was a really significant difference and very valuable and very useful, but obviously we need to um, promote this a bit more and perhaps we need to think about, you know, how this might be mandatory. But um, Telstra made its payphone Wi-Fi network. So the Wi-Fi um, on payphones, um, not every payphone has it, but most do, um, made that free. And that was excellent as well. Um, of course, the biggest problem with, you know, getting a Wi-Fi network up immediately is that, um, People can't do FPOS transactions over that. And so there's a bit of work going on at the moment to assess uh, whether there is a way to do FPOS transactions over satellite. Um, and um, and that, you know, there, there are obviously, I heard you were talking about the fuel issue there, Yuna. Um, there's also quite a bit of work going on by the telecommunications providers in relation to extending the battery life that they already of the mobile towers so um, this involves using different um, using spectrum in a different way um, and and potentially prioritizing traffic in a different way so quite clever um, solutions that might extend the life a bit more um, but of course the, the 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 biggest problem ultimately is coordination between the energy providers and the telecommunications providers and of course also then the emergency service and recovery um, agencies um, just to make sure that um, you know it's clear what roads are clear when people can get in um, to fix services and also when is the network going down and when is it coming back up again so that consumers can also have some expectations in that regard rather than then flooding the network trying to find out 
if in fact it's back online. Um, so, you know, I, th I think, you know, there is definitely going to be some improvements and um, it's very good to see that the industry has set up a um, coordination uh, group as part of its um, con uh, the Communications Alliance, the industry peak body, to look at all of these um, issues going forward. I can't hear you. I hope it's because you're on mute. It is. I've done it now. The biggest fear for my community uh, with fiber to the node uh, is that when they lose power, they lose their landline or I, we lose our landlines. Um, and uh, whereas the people on wireless um, will have kept their copper line, mm. assuming that continues, same with satellite. Yeah. So for fiber to the node customers and fiber to the curb customers, who, for whom when the power goes down, they lose not only their broadband, uh, their NBN broadband, but also their landline. Are yeah. you saying that, that in, from a resilience perspective, the only backup we can really expect to have is a mobile, some sort of mobile network backup? A am I understanding right that we can't expect yeah. the end to have any other, it is not capable of any other sort of backup. It's got to be mobile. Well, or satellite. Um, with a, if, if it's fibre to the premises, then you could have, yeah. a, some properties have a battery. Um, sure. Not every property has opted for that or been offered that. Um, and over time, potentially, some people who are in solar and have batteries would also, you know, have that backup. But of course, the problem is that it's not just your home, it's also the network. And so if it's a fibre to the node um, scenario, then that backup battery in home won't help. And so, yes, it is, it is an ongoing um, concern and it is something that over time we're going to have to really seriously look at um, whether in fact it actually provides that redundancy that we need. Um, obviously it won't in all places because of coverage um, and, you know, there, there is ongoing debate and discussion about that and it is something that consumers are very concerned about. They raise it with us all the time and, um, you know, it's, it's, so, it's such a, a hard thing because, you know, we've opted for an, a, a network that can allow us to do data and all sorts of other amazing things, but it relies on power, you know. It's this double-edged sword. Yeah, and, and you're right, it certainly creates in the Blue Mountains and the Hawkesbury a, a lot of angst amongst people as we head into a summer uh, and even when there are storms. So thank you just for helping me think that through. Um, can I just clarify, we've talked about um, the, some of the measures put in place to, by NBN to allow greater access and the providers to allow greater access uh, during COVID, but has there been any evidence of, of billing default rates or service disconnections increasing in spite of those efforts? Or or has there, yeah, I'm just curious. Yeah, so we've been asking quite a lot of questions about this. And whilst we understand a lot of people have asked for extensions and, and people have started to go on for, to financial hardship, um, we're not entirely clear how many. And so, um, you know, this is something we've been asking perhaps a regulator could look into and ask you some of its reporting powers to find out a bit more information. Um, what we're really concerned about is when, is, is how many people have actually been disconnected and we don't, we don't know the level of this. Um, and we've been also talking to financial counsellors because we think that uh, if there is a, a rising trend in this regard, it will start to present itself to those financial counselling services. And for a lot of them, they're very much thinking, look, we haven't hit the peak of the problem here yet because of the fact that we've got um, the increased job seeker, um, the job keeper arrangements, um, and also a lot of businesses are bunkering down and not necessarily making a long-term decision yet that potentially, you know, once all the additional measures have been removed, um, obviously now they've all been extended for a little while, um, that that's when we'll see, you know, a huge in increase in the amount of people who have to disconnect services or um, who haven't been able to get a financial hardship um, plan. We have seen some problems with people being able to contact their provider to get their financial hardship plans in place. And that's a concern. That's because of the customer service problems um, you know, that, that we highlighted earlier. I don't know, you know, did you want to add to that? I know you've been talking a lot more to financial counsellors. No, I think that, that really covers it, as you say. One, one of the issues has been 
customer service, not being able to get through to enter into financial hardship arrangements. And then because of that, uh, we've heard of people getting disconnected due to um, falling behind in payments, yeah. But there's no data available on that anywhere. There's, there's no there's no requirement to, to list the number of disconnections. There are there are requirements in energy in this regard to disclose um, the arrangements in relation to financial hardship. Um, you know, really, it would be up to our regulator to um, to request this information and then potentially make a decision about whether they're going to publish it or not. Mm. So in, in, what would your assessment be about how effective, without any data, I think this is maybe a hard question to answer, but how effective do you think the measures that have been put in place during COVID have been? And what evidence have you got to support the view yeah. that you have uh, on them? Yeah, look, I think they have had a measure of success because of the fact that, like I said, we've talked to financial counsellors, but clearly there'll be a lot of people that don't necessarily access financial counsellors, don't even know about them. Um, and also, you know, when you get into financial difficulty, um, there's a certain element of shame. A lot of people don't necessarily want to, to talk to anybody about it. Um, so yes, I think it's still very early to be able to assess that. Um, I think um, having said that, there has been a real, I mean, the, as has been communicated to us and in the public domain, in the media, there has been a real um, desire expressed from the telcos that they do want to look after their customers. Um, so I think they're coming from, you know, at, at the high level, they're coming from the right place. Um, whether that's through in their policies and procedures on the ground level is a whole different story. And I think we're yet to see the impact of this. Um, in the in your submission, you talk about um, the supporting strong continued investment in upgrading um, the fixed wireless network, uh, and we've talked a bit about this. I just I wonder whether you have um, whether you've looked at what would be a reasonable way to do that, uh, and is it simply converting fixed wireless to fibre to the curb or whatever? You know, becomes mm. the standard. How much thought have you given to what that actually looks like and can you paint a picture of it for us or have you more focused on the outcome that you want rather than the process? Mm. Look I think obviously we are always focusing on the on the outcome and the you know the utopia that consumers want which is you know a good connection wherever you live and work in Australia. Um, but and just to give you a bit a, a bit lower level of, of information. Um, we've always argued that there needs to be a communications fund that is reinvesting back into non-metropolitan areas um, because it's not just uh, it's not just a case of result relating to, to broadband but also mobile connections. So we've had quite a focus on uh, mobile blood um, and obviously the government's had its mobile blood of course, it's been very sort of, you know, um, bit by bit this round and then we'll, we'll wait and see whether there'll be a second round. And now we're up to round six, which is great. But what would be better is if we had an ongoing investment every year um, and we knew that, you know, every year there's going to be, you know, 150 million reinvested back into um, the network um, and, and infrastructure in non-metropolitan areas. Because we know that met non-metropolitan areas have always struggled for metropolitan equivalents. And, even though rural and regional remote consumers, they accept that their telecommunications services may never be as good as metropolitan areas. They still think that there has to be an, um, a, a huge effort put into making sure that at least they're accessing on a you know, somewhat equitable level, the types of services that people in metro areas can now access um, online. Uh, and also because they serve to benefit the most by being able to do that because they're, they're, they can't do face-to-face -face transactions. Um, so, you know, so there is this acceptance, but there's also we want to see the investment and we've said it should be a, an ongoing communications fund. And this is something that the Rural Regional Remote Communications Coalition that's uh, headed up by the National Farmers Federation, um, supported by us um, and over 20 other organisations. Um, and that they've argued for um, on an ongoing basis that there needs to be this investment. Um, having said that, we've also said that we do think that, you know, there will be different solutions in different places. Obviously, terrain has a big impact on what kind of technology you use. Um, there will always be some places in Australia that will use satellite. 
Um, but there has to be an alternative um, voice arrangement for them. And we're very invested in um, tracking the alternative voice trials at the moment um, that are looking at that. Um, so, you know, it hasn't just been, our focus hasn't just been on broadband in relation to this, it's been on a holistic sort of um, looking at all the technologies that are available and that are coming on board as time goes by. When we started building the, the MBN, there was no such thing as fibre to the curb. Now there is. Yeah, and look, I've got constituents who are only 75 kilometres from the Sydney CBD who are on satellite, on wireless. Um, I have every type of technology in the electorate. Um, so m m all those issues apply. And I want to ask about SkyMuster. Uh, just for, for my benefit and the benefit of the committee, are you able to run through what the current data allowances are for SkyMuster um, and... Uh, yeah, and what's metered and what's not metered, just to paint not a sure. picture of that. Um, so I'm going to start, but I'm going to throw to Una because she's much more across all of this, I hope. Okay, so, um, so, okay, so with Sky Master Plus, there's a bunch of things that are not metered and it relates to uh, um, websites that we may use a lot, so education websites. Um, you can do some Skype. Um, it will cover, uh, but it doesn't. Um, it doesn't. Co it'll cover Zoom as well. Um, so they're all meter free. Um, another thing we took great care to check was that the um, video relay service for deaf consumers is covered. That's meter free, um, which is excellent um, because that wasn't the case um, previously. Um, but of course, this is the Sky Master Plus service, right? So this is this is the the higher spend service already. Now, um, it's my understanding that many um, people who are offering, um, you know, home education in remote areas during this period um, have actually been able to upgrade to Sky Master Plus service without an additional charge um, for a limited period. Um, and of course, the other standard SkyMuster services have had double the amount of data. And for this, I'm hoping you go to throw to Yuna to be able to outline it for you. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't really know. If I, I, I can't um, give you a, an, some exact figures, but we'd be very happy to get back to you on that. Um, the, it's just one of the one of the frustrations with the standard SkyMuster service and the, the difficulty that. Um, that users have is that they have to be so so across the technology um, because to, sort of in order to access content they often have to have to sort of download it at off p cars and off p cars are you know but a very very inconvenient monumentally inconvenient it'll be sort of you know I, I can't remember exactly but you know it's 1 a.m to to 6 a.m. or you know those kind of hours, so they have to have technology to kind of download during that period. It all alternatively they have to stay um, stay up late and do it themselves. And it's been a particular problem um, with sort of accounting software, um, this sort of thing. So SkyMaster Plus has done quite a lot to address that. But as Theresa alluded to, it's a more expensive service, so it, it which which does impose a, a, another strain. But um, yeah, I, I can't really add too much more to it. I was going to say, part of the reason that we're balking at this is because every RSP has a slightly different price. Um, so we probably have to give you a range anyway. Yeah. Uh, that that lack of consistency m must make it hard for consumers or do they not get much choice about which RSP they use, given no, actually, where they are? This, this is one of the good things that SkyMuster has actually done for the first time Many consumers have never had any choice. They've only had one option, um, have now got multiple options. Of course, that brings with it the problem of, well, now you've got to compare. Um, and even, you know, like trying to encourage people, maybe you should try a different provider, has been a real cultural shift for people that haven't had choice in the past. Um, I mean, it's a cultural shift for some people in the city who've never changed provider ever as well. But it's an even bigger cultural shift for people in regional areas because they don't, they haven't been used to having these options. Um, and yes, um, the comparison issue can come up quite a lot. Um, people can get bamboozled by choice, um, and so you know, there's there's the benefit of of being able to have options, and hopefully that drives the prices down. But there's the challenge of am I getting the best value, and did I sign up for the right thing? Have I understood what people are comparing? when in actual fact, they're not offering much difference in their service, but they're trying to make it look different. 
um, and that's where the confusion comes in. Uh, are there any um, services that are currently metered that you think need to be unmetered, either those that have been temporarily unmetered because of COVID that should be maintained permanently, or other services that just haven't been made available in an unmetered way? Yeah, so, well, you know, we've, we've actually tested this quite a bit with MBN. Um, and, you know, initially we weren't even necessarily, they weren't even necessarily clear um, how it actually panned out because whilst they might make a decision to unmeter a particular application, they don't necessarily know what the uses of that application are. So, um, you know, for example, you know, if you'd asked everybody six months ago, um, did they know what Zoom was? Probably most Australians wouldn't necessarily have known. Whereas now it's just part of our vernacular and everybody knows what Zoom is. Um, and so, you know, our, our, our usage changes over time. So we really do have to keep an eye on this. And I'm pretty sure that because there's so many really savvy um, consumers out in these remote areas, such as the, you know, the Burr group, um, you know, they're, they're keeping a really strong eye on this all the time and, and raising with us what needs to, you know, be made, um, uh, you know, needs to be freed up. And so, for example, um, uh, we, in the early days of SkyMaster, were quite concerned about education, but now we have separate education ports. Um, for those that um, don't have those and our remote schooling because um, because it's a you know it's a homeschool situation because of the pandemic, then you know ultimately you know, we would want um, anybody who's providing remote education to be offered the SkyMaster Plus service without the additional cost. You know if they couldn't if they didn't have an education port. Um, per se. Um, this has been a real big problem for tertiary students that may be attending an institution in a regional centre or a city um, and then they go home they can't do their assignments because they've got a poor connection at home. Um, so you know and, and we all know now that um, that doesn't you know accessing um, education services means accessing video not just accessing um, you know websites um, with information. Um, you know, did you want to add to that at all? Um, yeah, just that the access for tertiary students over over SkyMaster um, is a, is an ongoing issue. Um, the the uh, because because the the um, education port doesn't include tertiary level students, so um, that that is that continues to be a problem. Um, obviously, a lot of tertiary education is done online, and and during this period, many tertiary students have been forced to to go back home, maybe to their parents' place or, or whatever. So um, that that had, that is a, an enduring issue at the moment, and it does need to be resolved. Um, just in terms of, of um, you know the the issue of what what websites should be, um, or what what content should be kind of metered and unmetered. Um, just in general, and this is a SkyMaster specific, but in general, you know we we have um, advocated for government websites and access to important services like health education. Um, and a range of other other content to be unmetered um, in terms of you know the, these are really important important issues because um, they're savings to the community but um, savings to the government too in in delivering services online and also to the private sector they're absolutely immense and um, it could be enhanced enormously by by you know that that type of assistance. So right now, if I'm accessing via SkyMaster, um, Centrelink or um, the ATO, is that metered or unmetered? Yeah, if you're on a, sorry, five button. If you're on a regular SkyMaster plan, it's metered. If you're on a SkyMaster Plus plan, it is unmetered. Okay. Um, at, in terms of the uh, satellite, the other issue that I get calls about is the ability to deliver voice services via satellite. Do you have any views about its ability, NBN satellite um, ability mm -hmm. to deliver voice services? So no matter what you do with a satellite service, you have a latency issue. This means there's always a little bit of a delay. And um, for people in metro areas, I always say, well, just remember what it used to be like to make an international call or what it can be like to make an international call to um, a, a, a fairly undeveloped country. It's, it's similar to that, that you will get in a, um, for a voice service on satellite. 
Um, one of the reasons that, so, you know, from our perspective, it's a case of, well, you know, it's not ideal. Um, but the other problem, of course, with voice services over satellite is that we know that satellites are not um, able to deliver a, a, as you know, resilient to service as other types of MBM provision because of the fact that um, weather will affect it. Um, and, you know, that, um, you know, if you have, uh, particularly up in the top end, very wet season, um, wet, wet season, then that can actually affect, if you even have a very large storm, it can actually affect um, a lot of cloud coverage can affect um, the satellite and how well the signal will come through. Um, if you're receiving um, something that doesn't um, rely so much on having an immediate real-time service, then, um, you know, it, it can cope a bit better um, with those sorts of um, challenges. Um, and so this is one of, these are the reasons that we've always argued that, and, and people in those remote areas have argued that they need an alternative voice um, arrangement in place as well. And for very remote areas, uh, I'm not sure um, whether, I know you said you have every technology in your electorate, I'm not sure whether you have HC HCRC network, which is the radio capacitor networks. So um, so this is um, for a service that's provided in very remote areas. Um, it's a service that has reached the end of its life almost, and um, it's an older technology. And so the government is currently looking at what will replace that. Um, there's lots of debates and discussion. And in fact, there's a alternative voice trial that's underway at the moment that will trial variously, various different types of, um, of wireless options that could actually replace it. Um, and there'll, there'll be multiple um, options that will be trialled during this phase. And, and hopefully out of that, we'll get something um, that can replace the HDRC um, service in those areas. That's the one we don't have. Um, th so the only other, um, well, there's two really quick questions, Chair, if I may. Um, it, just in terms of, we've just been talking about voice uh, delivered by satellite. Do you have any views about the ability of uh, wireless and the effectiveness of it as a as a, a voice um, service? You mean on fixed wireless on services? Fixed wireless, yeah. Yeah. So, look, in many parts of the world, fixed wireless services provide voice services very effectively, um, and you know there are people reporting that they're using it for um, VoIP services in Australia and it's working. Um, but of course, there are others that are experiencing the congestion issues um, in fixed wire, in some fixed wireless footprints um, that would not um, be very happy with um, switching their voice services. Um, and so I think that there probably would be some reticence from people. Um, in the, the, the biggest concern, I think, for people with having copper and fixed wireless together is they're paying for two services where in the city you're paying for one that does both those things. So you're, you're already facing an increased cost in a regional area. Um, and so ultimately it would be ideal if we can come up with some very robust um, technologies that work very well over fixed wireless because it would save cost for the consumer long term. But you will find, and I'm sure you already know this, that people will not give up their copper wire, um, their copper wire phone services very easily, um, especially if they're in bushfire or fl flood um, um, prone areas because they're, they're worried. They want to make sure that they have the backup options. Um, um, yeah, the, the feedback yeah. I get is that there seems to be a reluctance by Telstra to maintain a decent standard of service on those copper lines once NBN gets in. And so we do, my constituents do have a lot of trouble in trying to maintain a reliable yeah. copper service uh, once some sort of NBN is available, if it's fixed wireless or satellite. Is that uh, a we, experience? We have, the same, we have the same report. Yeah, we have the same reports. We are concerned about it, and we do think that it shouldn't just apply to maintaining the voice, but also the ADSL, because there's no plan to being able to cope with 420,000 plus users of ADSL switching over to fixed wireless, um, and what impact that might actually have. Uh, so there, there does need to be some consideration about this going forward, I think. And the reality that some people, um, you know, for whatever reason, may never switch over, may never, um, may always want their copper service in a re regional area. And what does that mean? Okay, look, Chair, I'll, I, I'll, I could ask lots more questions, but I will leave it there in case there are others who want to um, cover off some issues. Thank you. Thank you. We've got um, um, 
Madam Deputy Chair, about 40 minutes. I'm going to give um, um, about 30 of those to the coalition members if, and we'll perhaps double back at the end in terms of um, um, members from um, the opposition party. Um, can I just um, take the conversation to the enterprise market for a moment? I, I'm very interested in your comments that many incumbent operators within the enterprise market don't support MBN's entrance into the business enterprise and government markets. Um, and that um, from your comments, the MBN has had a positive impact on these markets. Um, can you comment further on the benefits you see from MBN providing um, uh, services into those markets and whether there are any regulatory blockers to it becoming more effective? Sure, I'll start and then I might throw over to Yuna. So just this morning um, in the industry um, news um, magazine that comes around, there was a report that Telstra has just announced that it is um, dropping the price of its enterprise services to 50% for those that are on net. So that means um, if you're contacting a customer also on the Telstra network, then you'll get it at a much lower price, 50% of the cost. Um, and from our perspective, and, and I think also the analysis of this article, says that this is a direct result of, of there being competitors in that market, um, and it lists MBN, TPG, Vocus um, as, as some of those competitors. So clearly there's a benefit um, to, to, to customers, and I think long term we haven't yet seen this fully play out um, in the marketplace, because obviously that's just Telstra to Telstra uh, communications. Um, and you know we think that it it would be um, beneficial to stay in that market for me to stay in that market. But I might just throw to Yuna and see if she has anything to add there. Yeah, just a, just a few comments. Um, so um, our concern is is very much the long term sustainability of MBN um, and its ability to maintain and upgrade services. So. You know, for that reason, we welcome its its um, entry into the enterprise market because it, you know, we see it as um, as an income stream that will assist it to cross subsidise residential services and continue to upgrade those. Which is a, you know, a, a, as previously mentioned, it's a, it's of huge importance. Um, uh, we do think that the cross subsidisation should be transparent because we'd be very um, concerned if the if the cross subsidisation went the other way. If there was a situation where residential, the residential market was actually acting to cross subsidise the enterprise market, um, we um, so we and, and we have actually um, mentioned this to the ACCC as, as an issue of concern. Um, from the, the small business perspective, as, as Teresa said, obviously we we welcome it that, that it will provide a kind of it, it will drive additional competition. Um, the the enterprise issue is is tends to be kind of a little bit beyond scope for us in a way because we don't represent um, large enterprises, big businesses. They can so um, represents the small business sector and residential consumers. But nevertheless, we do see that small and medium businesses do stand to, stand to benefit by the um, greater choice of network provider and um, and also you know particularly on NBN. There's a there's a greater choice of retailer because it's a neutral platform. So um, we don't have any any particular concerns about MBN embarking into the enterprise market. Um, Senator Davey, I think you've got a few questions. Thank you. Um, just a couple of questions on on the sort of evolution of NBN over time. I know in um, in your submission, you mentioned that NBN uh, took action to support greater transparency and reporting, particularly of outages, in response to actions taken by the ACCC. Do you think that um, the NBN have had a tendency to wait to be pushed, or are they becoming more proactive in addressing issues and concerns as they mature as a corporation? Mm. I think that's a fair question to ask because initially we did have a lot of challenges engaging with NBN, but now they have like uh, quite an extensive um, 
engagement team, NBN Local, and they spend quite a lot of time getting out there and, and talking to people. And um, the outages issue, not surprisingly, is one that gets talked about a lot and how um, people can communicate with them. Um, probably the shining light there is that they ha now have um, regional roundtables on a regular basis. And through the pa throughout the pandemic, they actually, um, they actually convened that on a weekly basis. So anybody that had any concern that was involved in any of the um, re rural, regional, remote um, communications group could actually directly raise issues with MBN. Um, so that that um, avenue is very pleasing, I have to say. Um, and you know, we um, really um, pleased to see that that's even extending now into you know a greater interest in um, affordability issues as well. Um, we've been running. Um, forums, virtual forums um, with MBN. We've run, run one in Western Australia and one in um, NT and South Australia. We're about to run one in Victoria where we're assisting MBN to build its network out into the community and to um, understand better directly um, how their products and services might um, benefit consumers, particularly ones and constituents that aren't already uh, um, aren't already connected to NBN and what are the barriers to that. So that, that is a very pleasing development. Um, obviously it takes some time to go from that engagement to actually then develop the new products. Um, but, you know, um, it's definitely changed in the time that NBN has been around. And I don't know if um, you know wants to add something maybe more specific to that um, section 87 um, that the ACCC um, did. Yeah, just, uh, just in terms of um, outages and notification of, of customers about outages, um, I think it's important to remember that um, the retailers have a role to play here too, because, you know, really from our, our perspective as users of MBN services, our, relation really is, our relationship really is with our retailer. Um, and it, it, it's, a, it's a whole chain of information that MBN needs to have good information and really up-to-date information, prompt information available to its retailers, but then its retailers need to immediately pass that on to their customers. So the, the customers are aware of what planned outages are, are going to be and they can adapt and, and work around that. Um, but alternatively, if, you know, if they're unplanned outages, there needs to be an easy way to communicate with customers so customers know what the hell is going on. Um, and that's, that's a really relevant point because one of the key things that I get coming into my office is, is a bit of a the disconnect of who is ultimately responsible. The consumer has the relationship with the retailer. NBN is the wholesaler. NBN are communicating better across the board. Um, but I wonder whether this is not also... Um, facilitating the confusion because now people think that they can go direct to NBN and have their issues resolved instead of actually dealing with their retailer. Um, so wh what's, what's your thoughts about the structure of the system and whether uh, it's working um, fit for purpose? Yeah, I mean, there's no question that it's much harder to resolve an issue when you've got multiple providers or multiple players in the chain of delivery. And that doesn't just happen in broadband, it happens with um, lots of different types of services now that we access over, um, over telecommunications networks. And it will continue to get more complex in that regard as we take on more devices and types of services. Um, so I, I do think that many people are starting to appreciate that chain of delivery and that difficulty. But of course, you know, the truth is consumers just want things to happen easily and seamlessly. And ultimately our preference She seems to have frozen, so I might shut up. Yes. Maybe, maybe I'll just kick in. Um, I, I think that the, the important, just going back to my earlier comments, a um, really important thing from the consumer's pers perspective is the retail obligations, because ultimately that's the entity that the consumer has a contract with. There isn't a direct contractual relationship with, with MBN. Um, MBN has the, has the contractual relationship with retail service providers. Um, so it, it, it's a it's a, a, a waterfall relationship. So there needs to be a really uh, you know really firm obligations on 
um, retail service providers to act swiftly and um, really be responsive to customer needs. Um, and also kind of realize that in this kind of, uh, when you've got a separate wholesale and retail layer, um, there's a whole, a whole different kind of complication and set of obligations that apply there. Yeah. So hopefully that addresses your question, Senator David. Um, yes, thank you. I'm not, I'm not sure if it, um, I'm not sure if we, there's any simple solution to that suffice to say that we, we really need both the MBN and the retailers to be working together to make sure consumers get uh, yeah. all the information they need, particularly with, with outages. Uh, I think outages is the key complaint that we keep getting in. And some of the outages are an NBN issue. Some of the outages are actually an issue at the, at the retailer's level because they're upgrading their systems um, and it, it is, multi-layers that often the end users, they, they only feel the frustration. They don't yeah. um, necessarily want to follow the bouncing ball. That's right. And, and from an end user perspective, really they shouldn't have to kind of be across all the technicalities and the, 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 the you know, um, they, they should just have a single point of reference. Otherwise it's just incredibly confused, confusing. And then there's the risk of a blame game. Um, where the, the customer's actually just, you know, is, is the, you know, the RSP directs the retailer to, N, uh, directs the consumer to NBN and so on. Um, so just a, a further point is um, in the installation process, that, that, is, that is obviously even more complicated because you've got often, you know, separate subcontractor who's actually comes on site and is doing the installation. Um, and there, there's a complicated kind of process where the, the order comes in through the retail service provider, um, but the subcontractor is subcontracted to NBN. Um, so at that point, there is kind of more of a direct relationship um, from, from the, 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 the consumer to NBN. But it, 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 again, that can be incredibly complicated. Thank you, nothing further Thanks. from me, Chair. Thanks, Perrin. Can I just... Um, double back to the, the online forums that MBN is conducting at the moment. I'm really pleased to hear you uh, effectively congratulating MBN Local because I've got to say I felt there was a huge shift in in attitude when MBN moved to create those local teams. Um, more recently, um, MBN are conducting a series of online forums and they're enlisting the assistance of colleagues and I expect others have had this experience in, in engaging their networks um, to conduct these online forums, um, <clears throat> pushing, I think, into the, in, into the business market with the MBN business. I just wonder, um, is there, and, and the problem with this I find is that you end up getting the people that don't need to help on those forums and finding it very hard to connect with the people who do need um, the assistance and or would benefit from the information that's being disseminated via those forums. Is there a role, is there a role for ACAN to assist um, yeah. MBN in kind of socialising the fact that these forums take place and that people can join them um, and, and gain the advantages from them? Absolutely. I mean, very happy to help with the ones that um, uh, MBN Local's doing with politicians. I wasn't aware of those ones, but we've been um, the ones that we're doing. So just to jump back and talk a little bit about Rural, Regional and Remote Communications Coalition, um, MBN uh, actually gets quite a, a group of different types of organisations dialing into that. And each of those organisations, I mean, many of you will be familiar with them, the CWA, um, even the Royal Flying Doctors Service, all of them service different constituents, and and but they also serve as um, points to distribute further information. So they're really useful um, organisations to tap into um, that community um, information network, and they're already providing information as a trusted source to different communities. And so I think it's very much that model that we're looking at um, broadening to other areas, uh, and. 
Um, that's exactly what's been happening with the ones that we're running at the moment about focusing on um, no Australian left offline, so the affordability issue. Of course, if you run an NBN forum, you never stick to one issue. You're always covering a raft of issues. Um, and of course, in those issues, we're in those forums, because uh, we're going through a pandemic, we're covering off on the pandemic issues too. Uh, and so once again, we've got a number of agencies that are dialing in and, and or joining in on those video conferences. And then um, there's an undertaking to come back to them. So it's not just a one-off. Um, so there is a conversation that's built. And, and those organisations are community champions. They're working with communities and they're linked into the grassroots already. And so I think that that's um, a really important way to get the information out. And I think that that has actually, it, I've been watching some of the terrible situation that's been happening out in Victoria and, and talking about some of the difficulty of communicating with some, some communities because of language and, and, and age and, and all sorts of reasons. Um, and one of the big messages that's come out of that is to use the community sector, can engage through the community sector and engage through organisations that are existing, that are trusted sources. And um, in instances where people don't speak the same language, um, that don't speak English, then um, they're, they're um, ways to get the information out in other languages as well. Um, you know, I don't know if you want to add to that, but happy to help um, wherever we can in that regard as they can. We see that as part of our role, um, you know. Um, yeah, I, I'm not too much else to, to add to that. Um, we, we do work very closely with um, COSBOA and, um, you know, we, we work with the Australian Small, small Business and Family Enterprise on, Ombudsman's Office and also other, other small business groups. And, you know, we very much try to um, target our information to the small business market um, and also to micro businesses as, as well, um, because we see that um, those are people that need need a, a huge amount of assistance and understanding kind of what services are available. Um, but but it, you know it it's a market that actually is notoriously difficult to to reach. That's why we stick to the peak groups and we use those networks. We we feel that's the most effective way of doing it. Before I ask um, Cindy Antic to to um, continue, can I just um, raise one issue? I will ask one further question that is digital literacy is a, a very broad term but I use it in this context um, um, to mean um, a better understanding of the architecture of the MBN who's responsible for what retail providers versus wholesale providers um, different types of plans um, providing different types of outcomes for different settings um, is there more that government and the MBN can do to improve uh, digital literacy in and around the MBN? Because I ask this question because I sometimes sit in my office listening to constituent officers dealing with inquiries about the MBN, which I think are pretty entry level understanding, but we seem to continue to have to explain the difference between MBN's role and that of the telcos, etc. And I think that leads to not only confusion, but frustration because people go and seek a solution to a particular problem from the wrong entity. Okay, um, look, I'll, I'll have a go at answering the question. Teresa's um, back online now. Um, she just dropped out during your question. Um, uh, so, um, the, um, the, uh, there is a definite role for government here in, um, in um, the area of digital literacy and to help increase the understanding of, of uh, particularly um, you know, the skills that are needed to get online and training people to get online um, the, the, um, and the, the, the benefits. Um, the people, people who aren't really engaging online often don't really kind of appreciate the, the benefits of being online. Um, so that, that is, that's very important. They need to understand how it can help them in their everyday lives or in their business. Um, in terms of under, better understanding of NBN and the industry structure, um, the, the retail service provider relationship. I, I think it sort of goes back to the comments that uh, we were making earlier to, in response to Senator Davies' question. In some ways, it's questionable why, why consumers need to actually be across that. Um, really, um, for most people, they, what, they, they should just have a straightforward relationship with their retail service provider, and their retail service provider should actually take care of the rest. 
Um, obviously, it's a different issue in the whole transition to end the end. Um, the community has had to engage with this, um, and, and it, it has been a big upheaval. And you know, as I'm sure we're all aware, there have been a lot of ups and downs in that process. But um, thank goodness that's more or less coming to an end now. Um, so um, yeah, the, the the answer is yes. That there is there is definitely a role for government, and we're aware that um, that there's been some quite a few plans that have been funded, like the um, uh, the seniors program, the digital seniors program. Um, that's uh, the, that, that's been been funded from from the government, but um, it, it's, it is an ongoing issue, and and it will remain so um, because it's digital literacy is one of the the big areas, and as well as affordability and also access to devices and the the, the right equipment. Um, th these are the kind of big barriers to people getting online and getting the most out of out of the digital services that are available to them. Teresa, did you want to add to that? I just quickly, I gathered the questions about digital literacy because I did miss the question. Um, oh, it, it was I, more about a digital literacy as, obviously it's a bit, very big term, but the, the literacy I'm talking about here is people having an understanding of the architecture of the oh. um, of the MBN, namely wholesale okay. versus retail, uh, the, yeah. the, the need to ask for more details from service providers about the types of service they're buying, mm -hmm. being cautious about uh, lowest priced offers, all these things, that kind of yeah. digital awareness, yeah. because I just feel as though people continue to contact my office with what are clearly um, telco issues but raising mm. it in the context of wanting a solution from MBN. Yeah, okay. And I guess part of that's been a difficulty because obviously being a national infrastructure project, um, you know, the the government, um, you know, over the 10 years, both, um, both sides of um, politics have wanted to, you know, present to the public, this is what we're investing in. So that that has also um, created some of the, cre the, the confusion, I think. Agreed. Um, so, uh, with um, uh, what I'd just like to point out is that um, ACAN does do some consumer education, but, and we call it this part, we talk more about consumer education rather than digital literacy, because I think digital literacy tends to focus more on the skill set you need to actually use um, services online. Um, so this is about choosing a service and, and and navigating the marketplace to you know get a good option. And then if you do have a problem, how you resolve it and what you need to know. So we've actually got some materials that we've just published called Talking Telco on our website. Um, and they're actually in multiple languages and also accessible. So they're in Auslan videos as well. Um, and there's some information in, um, recorded information in, in a couple of indigenous languages as well. Um, and what we've tended to focus on is very high level information about, you know, this, this is what you can do and what you need to know at a bare minimum. It's simple, it's straightforward. And when you run into a problem, this is where you go. Um, and, you know, you go to the ombudsman, um, you know, you might you go to the retail service provider, then you go to the ombudsman um, and giving people simple steps so that they don't necessarily have to, like Eunice said, understand everything that's going on. And about the only thing that we provide that um, I should say is a little bit more detailed is we have a SkyMuster um, booklet as well and guide um, to give people on SkyMuster a little bit more information because maybe they need a little bit more technical know-how um, and that can make them feel a bit more confident and it's provided a more basic language um, than they may well, well otherwise have seen. And we also have a diagram on our website that explains to every household how your broadband connection works, that it could be a problem with anything from, you know, possibly the NBN connection, possibly something in your house, or even your equipment, and giving them the, the knowledge so that they can actually have that conversation with their telco, because quite often um, with the buck passing, um, that can be the, 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 the reason that happens is because the consumer can be a little bit bamboozled by what aspects are, um, are being um, taken care of by, by who and by what. Um, and that's, it's, you know, like you said, people focus on the MBN, but in actual fact, the reality is that there are multiple aspects to the service delivery, including the device that you're actually using. Cinder Antic has long promised, I'm handing um, over to you. Sorry, I was on mute. It seems to be a common problem. Um, thank That's you. fine. 
five officially too. <laughs> Started talking, I was on mute. Who would have thought? Um, look, my question, just if I could come back to um, the Infrastructure Australia report. I think um, you referenced it in your submission, uh, and it said um, 44% of consumers found services too costly. Um, are you aware of the fact that the report was actually referring to the NBN... Or sorry, if the report was referring to the NBN specifically... Um, it, it, it isn't based on a survey I've done of 2018 of all telco services. And do you think ultimately it's appropriate to ascribe that entirely um, to the NBN experience itself? Oh, look, absolutely. Of course, there's you know a struggle to get the right data in, in relation to that. And and um, and of course, you know, I think we'd acknowledge the limitation that you've already highlighted. Um, there, but um, I mean, notwithstanding that, um, the reality is that we do know um, that, that you know, apart from the broad general market um, and perceptions of the affordability, that you know, we do know that affordability actually is an impost for people connecting um, who are on the lower incomes, and that's why really our advocacy on this is really focused in on on making sure that we put some measures in place to address that. Um, that barrier rather than, um, you know, the, the fact that some people, you know, who, who are not on a lower income are noticing that there is a slight increase when they transition to the MBN. There are other people who are noticing a decrease. So it will depend on in, in the, you know, in the mainstream market, not talking about low income consumers, um, that there is a variation of experience there. So accept your point. Thank you. And Andy, do you have anything further? No, no thank you, Chair. Um, colleagues, do we have anyone else before um, on, on the line who um, I'm going to open it up generally um, now? So we've got technically 15 minutes. We don't need to detain our witnesses if we don't need to, but I, um, I open it to the floor. I think you're happy with that, are you, um, Madam Deputy Chair? Yes, actually, I've got a question that came out of your question around the digital literacy. Is it right if I okay. ask that one? Um, the issue of digital, I mean, we were talking about digital literacy in a couple of ways, but I'm thinking about it in terms of the barrier it is for people to even uh, want to engage. And I know there there's an organisation in my uh, region called LEAP, which has um, a program called Tech Mates, where someone will give one-on-one -on -one, uh, coaching and advice. It was face-to-face, -face, it's moved over the phone, they're starting to move back to face-to-face. -face. How? So my question is, from what you're hearing from consumers, how important is it that uh, people are not only, that those services are not only available if people reach out for them, but that we actively encourage people to engage uh, is that you said it was one of the? I think you said it's one of the biggest issues, and I just wondered if yeah. what you think we should be doing to bridge that that divide. Yeah, sure. So first of all, I should say we know Leap as well. They're a member of ACAN, so fantastic organisation doing some excellent work. Um, and there is a number of there is hundreds of organisations around Australia now through Be Connected, um, which is the, um, the program that's been funded by the government to provide services to seniors. But there is also um, private sector investment. So Telstra has um, been investing in Central Australia um, in a Digimob um, through um, First Nations media um, to deliver some um, very specific um, training that, that is delivered by um, Indigenous mentors. Uh, and also there are other examples. Info Exchange is another example in Victoria um, who are doing some fantastic community and consumer engagement and, and digital literacy programs. Um, and there are many, many other organisations that are funded through you know, one-off council grants and, and state government grants, um, delivering services around the whole of Australia. Um, the, the problem that we've got 
is that we ultimately need um, digital literacy for any kind of consumer, not specifically a senior or a, an Indigenous consumer. There is also a need for, um, for work to be done that targets small business. There is work that needs to be done for young consumers to target, you know, how they become um, better consumers and, and know, you know, their consumer rights because they, we can make the assumption that they're tech savvy, but some of the information we get is that, you know, kids coming out of school aren't necessarily great at, at navigating the online job market for example. Um, so from our perspective there is always going to be an ongoing need to invest in digital literacy and the reason is because technology changes and people change. So people's needs change and people's abilities change. Um, over time as they are aging they may become less able to, to, to use technology in the same way and this can relate to somebody who's very tech savvy, who tomorrow may not be very tech savvy when the technology changes and evolves. Uh, so, um, you know, this is something I think the government will need to think about on an ongoing basis and will need to think about if we make sure that we're getting everybody connected in a way that they can affect um, online and actually doing the things they need to do and not feeling like they need to, um, um, get their, you know, their their relative, their friend, their neighbour to help them, or not do something because they're too scared. Um, then we do need to invest in it on an ongoing basis, and we need to make these um, channels very easy for people to access. Um, one of the big concerns during COVID has been, um, I got raised this by um, the Australian Seniors Computer Clubs, is that they haven't been able to continue because it's a face-to-face -face thing. So um, they haven't been able to do it under social distancing. Um, so you know, there, there's all sorts of considerations that do need to be taken into play into 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 consideration. But they do, we do need to make sure that we're investing in it on an ongoing basis and that we're thinking about it for longevity and for you know people's whole of life, not just you know at any particular point in their life. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Colleagues, any further questions for uh, ACAN? For me. Excellent. So, um, colleagues, um, can I take this opportunity to thank uh, Ms. Lawrence and Ms. Corbyn uh, on behalf of um, our committee for um, the submission, but also for uh, giving evidence today, as well as the work, uh, ladies, that ACAN does uh, in, in this space. I think if, if COVID, when, it, when it's all washed up, will have taught us a lot about a lot of things. But I think one of the strongest themes coming out is the very um, strong sense that um, digital and virtual environments using telecommunication networks um, are very much where uh, our future is headed and the importance of them, particularly in a country the size of ours. Uh, that, of course, concludes today's proceedings. Um, I can't recall a request for a question on notice or further material, but if there was one that um, I missed, uh, any uh, answers or requests for further material um, should be provided to the Secretariat by the 28th of August. Uh, I thank you again for your evidence. I thank Hansard and Broadcasting, as well as uh, the diligent staff at Secretariat for their assistance. Uh, and I declare this hearing adjourned. For the benefits of colleagues, um, we have... A Thank you.